Hello and welcome to UFC's Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gunn with top UFC analyst Dan Hardy. When Michael the Count Bisping knocked out Luke Rockhold to become the UFC middleweight champion, the ultimate fighting fairy tale became a reality. Now, for the first defense of his title, he must face a man who has starred in his nightmares since UFC 100. I've been fighting for almost 20 years. I've got two or three pride belts and a strike force belt as well, and the UFC is the last belt that I set a goal to get. I've been a lifelong fighter from the moment I was born. The number one goal people want to achieve in mixed martial arts is to be the UFC champion of the world. I am the UFC middleweight champion. Dan Henderson is not. I am the better fighter. I will beat him, and we will no longer hear about Dan Henderson. So, Dan, UFC 204 Manchester, England, uh, with Michael the Count Bisping leading the charge. Let's get the facts and the stats up. A couple of things I've noted, 18-0 and 0 in UK competition. Yeah. Loves a rematch. Things are looking good for our champion, Michael Bisping, but, I mean, it, oh, it's haunting, isn't it? It's <laughs> haunting. We've watched that clip many times this week. It, yeah, well, uh, thousands of times over the past few years. I was actually at the event live, and I remember the reaction of the crowd. I mean... Michael was such a polarizing character on The Ultimate Fighter that really a lot of people were behind Dan Henderson to, to kind of carry the flag for the US, obviously. And um, it, it, was a, it was a tough ask for Michael at that point in his career. You can see, looking back at it, that he was, he was quite green. I mean, there were certain things that he was very, very good at, but he wasn't equipped to fight Dan Henderson at that moment in, right. in his career. And he's, he's improved so much since then. Yeah. Obviously, Dan Henderson still campaigning at, at the ripe old age of 46 and doing, okay. a, doing a good job. I mean, obviously, his last fight was spectacular. So yeah. it's beautiful to see him getting a title shot. Yeah, absolutely. A legend, a Hall of Famer, and possibly his last outing. I think that's what he said. Yeah. But Michael, Michael Bisping is seeking revenge. Said he's going to, like, play with him for a couple of rounds and knock him out. Lots of fighting talk, as you would expect. But let's turn back the clock a little bit and examine Mr. Dan Henderson. Yes. Of old. Well, you know, I love dragging fights out yeah, of the, yeah. the archives. And, and th this is the Dan Henderson that I grew up watching, um, the, the Dan Henderson that inspired me throughout my career. And I, I think, well, this is the fight that I've picked against Vanderlei Silva, Pride 33. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much 10 years ago now, almost 10 years ago. It, it basically gives a good demonstration of who Dan Henderson has always been and, and the skills that he brings to the table. Um, Sean Tompkins in his corner, rest in peace. Mm. Um, so, as you can see here, beautiful Greco takedown there, nice trip, threatens the guillotine immediately. Now, Vandalay Silva, this was really when he was at his most ferocious. Um, and, and Dan Henderson handled him fairly well, took him down again, smothered him up against the fence, used really good ground and pound to wear on him. And I love this as well. Watch how he grabs the wrist, pins him to the floor, and then hits. Very creative, just finding opportunities to, 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 to strike. Um, and this as well, beautiful spinning back fist as well, set Van der Lilt there, showed, exposed himself so he could put the turn in. And then this is really what we know about Dan Henderson. He catches Van der Lee's, uh, attention with the big right hand and then steps forward. Van der Lee, the person that he is, stands his ground, starts to trade with, with Dan Henderson and gets caught with a big powerful left hook. And not mm. necessarily the punch that Dan Henderson's known for, it's all about the right hand. Yeah. But in that circumstance, when you're going to stand in front of Dan Henderson, he can generate so much power. From, from, either, from either hand, it's really. It's deceiving when you look at his frame as well. It is, it is. And you'll notice, and there's something I want to talk about a bit later as well, but he's quite rigid in his midsection, which is why he doesn't tend to throw a lot of straight punches, in my opinion. But he's very good at twisting, he's very good at, at, at using his midsection to talk power into the punches. And I think that's partly due to his wrestling. I find a lot of the time when I'm grappling with uh, wrestlers or judokas, they've, they've got that same kind of strength where they can just maneuver you around very well. And when that translates into punching power, you get guys like Stipe Miocic, who's got a good wrestling background, yeah. who's got a very short right hand. Obviously, Johnny Hendricks has got a nice, powerful short left hand as well. So it seems to transfer quite well into punching power, but only at a, only at a short range, which is something we'll, we'll speak about in a second. OK, well, our next bit of video is obviously the first fight. Yeah, yeah. Torturous for Michael Bisbing to watch, I would imagine, yeah. and it's been just hellish for him to keep having this replay time after time. Of course, we've got the logo on the shorts. <laughs> it's all there yes. for Michael, which is why he's so very keen to get this done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this is, for Michael, at this stage in his career now, he's really beaten, you know, a, a lot of contenders. He's established himself so well in the middleweight division, and he's been campaigning for so long. Now he's got the, the belt. He has a bit of leeway to kind of decide the fights that he wants and, and pick off the guys that have been 
well, haunting his, his nightmares, yeah. as you said earlier. Dan yeah. Henderson, this big knockout, has been following him throughout the rest of his career. You know, it, it's been reminded of it. It's on highlight reels, <laughs> Dan Henderson shorts, which I will point out in a second. But let's have a look. Let's 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 go through the first fight. I want to talk about a few things in this one. Mainly what Dan Henderson was doing right and what Michael was doing wrong. Um, and I mean, look how young he looks. He, he looks so <laughs> different now in comparison to how he did then. But you can see the pressure immediately Dan Henderson was putting him under, hunting for that right hand. There was no secret of what, about what Dan Henderson was, was trying to do. But what you'll notice, Michael tends to circle towards the right hand. Now, he's a great kickboxer. He's very good at using his range. But every time Dan Henderson threw that overhand right, you'll see Michael lean back out of the way to try and slip the punch. But because there was no variety in that, Dan Henderson acknowledged that there was a target there, acknowledged that there was an opening to throw that right hand and started to work towards it. Now, there were moments where, where Michael did good things, keeping Dan Henderson on the end of his range, obviously, but getting back to against the fence is not ideal. But when he was using his footwork and when he was moving in the right direction, or at least changing the direction which he was moving, it kept Dan Henderson on the outside. You'll notice that when, when Michael's moving opposite directions, Dan Henderson kind of is a bit stuck for options. He needs Michael circling towards that right hand. And he uses a couple of tools to do this. One is his jab, and like I said, you don't tend to see him throw a jab cross. And that's because I don't think there's a great deal of rotation in his midsection. What it does allow him to do is close that distance down and really power that big right hand over the top. So you can see him using the jab. You'll also see him using a, a nice inside low kick, which keeps Michael moving towards that. Now, let's just have a quick look at that. So as Dan Henderson throws the right hand over the top, Michael steps in with a one-two here. And as the punch comes over, you can see Michael leaning back away with his chin up. Now. You can get away with that if you've got the range to do it. But Dan Henderson's so determined to keep pushing forward. Before you press play there, Dan, so what should he be doing? If he shouldn't be trying to weave out the way with his chin tool, how else can he be moving? Well, Because this, I guess, is relevant for how he's going to avoid that big right hand. Most definitely. I mean, obviously, circling the opposite direction is okay. helpful. Um, but the other thing as well is, if you do the same thing every time, the target's always going to be there. Right. If he starts to look to roll underneath or to counter it, there are a few options, which we'll address later in, in okay. a later playlist, but because he did it consistently and because it was almost like second nature to him, it was programming, every time he saw the right hand coming over, he came out of the way. And this, this is instinctual, and this is, as fighters, we have to reprogram certain things. When someone throws a punch at your face, if you've never been punched before, your habit is to close your eyes, lift your chin up, and turn your face away. The three worst things you can do. Yeah. And there is an effort when you're learning striking to start reprogramming these things. So you start tucking your head, keeping your eyes open, and then start rolling under the punches, or even closing the distance. And it was just something that Michael was doing so consistently that Dan Henderson knew the target was there. But as you can see, because he wasn't landing it, because he was getting impatient, and because there was so much, um, there was so much tension between the two, you could really see Dan Henderson is closing this door He's not allowing Michael to circle into, into this direction because he's circling away from the power of Dan Henderson there. So he will constantly use the jab and the inside low kick to keep pushing Michael in that direction, hoping eventually that he can scoot him towards the fence and circle him onto that right hand, which, which he starts to do here. You can see the jab, Michael's moving in the right direction, and you'll start seeing <laughs> Dan Henderson starts to push forward an inside low kick, and he does the same thing. He pause, and then there's the knockout punch. Now, there are two things I want to talk about here. One I've already discussed is the, 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 the direction that Michael was circling. The other thing is the inside low kick. Now, Dan Henderson's not known necessarily for using kicks, but what this low kick does is not only does it force Michael to circle towards the right hand, but it steps Dan Henderson's foot very close to Michael's back leg, which closes the distance, closes the range, and puts him pretty much forehead to forehead with Michael Bisping, allowing him to throw a real tight, powerful overhand right. Because he often gives up the reach. He does, he does. I mean, he's always been fighting bigger guys. I mean, he knocked Fedor out, for example. Yeah. He's been fighting heavyweights, and yeah. he fight anybody that will take, take the fight against him. But watch this. What you'll see is you'll see his feet skip, and he'll replace his front foot with his back foot to kick. Yeah. But what you'll notice is that there's no commitment to the kick. All of his weight's on his back leg. And like I was saying, because he doesn't have that twist in his midsection, because he, can't, he doesn't stand and twist through with the punch to generate the power, yep. he uses a rocking motion. OK. So he goes, hit, and then pendulums over. OK. So let's watch this. You'll see he's going to skip forward, bang. Now, let's just, let me just look at that foot. Look how close that is to Michael Bisping. Yeah. 
He stepped right in. I mean, there's, there's a foot between them, really. And he also knows that Michael's habit is to lean back. Yeah. So he's confident that if he just wings that over the top... He's not even looking. No, he's not. He's not. He knows it's coming. He can see the way that Dan Henderson's moving. The other benefit in using the, the inside low kick, which you'll see with Michael here, is he picks his leg up to check it. When he starts to register that, automatically he starts to pick his leg up. Right. Puts him on his back leg. Yes. It, it, allow, it, it stops him moving further out of the way. It stops him going here. Or pivoting and moving. Or pivoting him. off. Yeah. It plants that back foot, so all he's got then is the lean back. And as he leans back, Dan Henderson plants the foot and then bangs straight over the top. And now the next punch, I know Dan Henderson says he, only, he, he never used that before. The Van der Lee Silver fight yeah. proves different. And the Hector Lombard fight <laughs> as well. <laughs> exactly. So it was a very dramatic knockout. We're just going to see it from a couple more angles. I apologise, Michael. I know you, don't, you probably don't like watching this. I, I've had this same situation with my own knockout in the past. It, it's, you know, it's one of those things that, I mean, look at, look at, the, look at the air oh, yeah. that he's, Dan Henderson gets. He's removed gets. his feet. From, it's, it's just It's ridiculous. full body weight. Everything he's throwing. You can, and, I mean, you can see the venom. In that, you can see how much, how much he intended to damage Michael in that point. We've spoken about fighters, true breed fighters yeah. before. He, you need to literally put him off of opponents. A bit like Robbie Lawler, yes. I think, was the guy that we showed an example of. You, exactly. The referee's got to get in the way. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, Joanna as well, she's exactly the same. You've yeah. got to drag her off her opponent. Yeah. You know? um, what's important about this shot right here, and I've paused it right at the, right at the correct spot, <laughs> This, this Dan Henderson here, in mid-air, with the big H-bomb coming down from the heavens, he's taken this and he's, it's become his logo. So it's on yes. all of his shorts now, which obviously Michael takes offence at, mm. and it's something that is a constant reminder of this knockout. Now, everybody, when they see that logo, they know that it's from this knockout. Yes. So that it's kept it current, it's kept it... Which is probably why he's ended up with a title shot against Michael, you know, to... To, to get that rematch that, that Michael wants. I mean, it's, it's such a massive shot. I was actually sat next to Michael's father when that happened, and the, the whole of Mandalay Bay went up as he sat down. It was, it, it was, it was. I mean, I, I'm a fan of both guys, and I, you know, you never like to see someone take a big shot like that. But given the drama going into this, and given the fact that, that pretty much the whole of the United States was on Dan Henderson's side going into that because of the character that Michael had played on the Ultimate Fighter, yeah, it was such a dramatic finish to a really dramatic build-up. Mm. And, uh, I mean, a perfect ending for Dan Henderson, but obviously for Michael, it, was, it really spurred him on in his career to do greater things, which obviously he has. Yeah, lots of chapters have since been written since then, mm. and lots of people have been writing about UFC 204. Okay. Let's take a look and see who's got some questions for us. Let's go with... Uh, let's go here. So, uh, what has Bisbing improved on most since UFC 100? Is Hendo's wrestling hidden in the shadows, waiting to come out... Or is it gone? I can weigh in a little bit on this one. Since, well, since 2011 against Fei Zhao, Hen that was the last time Hendo landed more than one takedown. Wow. This is an Olympic-level wrestler. That's interesting. That's a long time ago. I think he's out, he's like one takedown in his fight since then, but that's I think he had three in that fight. Yeah. That's surprising, but one thing that, that we... I mean, obviously, we know Dan Henderson's a credentialed wrestler, and, and a lot of people stepping in there don't really want to engage with him there because they know he's such a strong yeah. wrestler. Apart so, from DC. Apart from DC, yeah, of course. Um, but the other thing with Dan Henderson is that he, he's able to utilise that wrestling to set up other things. Um, we, I've got a good example coming up in this next playlist, which I'll, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but because people know when they lock up with him that he's a, he's a danger, they tend to really, really force themselves out of it and then get caught. Ah, uh, now, let me just pause there. Let me just skip back just one second. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's the logo. That's really, that's re that really epitomises how proud Dan Henderson is of that knockout. And that is, if Michael Bisping was lying down here sleeping, yeah. that's what he's been dreaming about as exactly. well for some yeah. years. Just to give you an idea of the motivation he has for this fight. I mean, th this, there's so much going into this. There's so much history, there's so much tension between these two. I love it. I love these kind of fights. Now, if Michael Bisping ends up replicating a knockout like that, is he going to put it on his shorts for his next title <laughs> defence? I'd be interested to see because... Yeah, a little deal with Reebok, maybe. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, 
But that, as you can see here in the clinch against, uh, against Hua, he was able to turn him onto a punch and really land a really short, nice right hook that he then rushes on and lands another clean uppercut. Now, Tim Bosch was, wanted to start this fight very early. We're, we're 15 seconds in now, and he runs straight onto a right hand. And you can even see him guarding here. Look what he's doing. He's covering here because he's expecting the overhand right. And you can see Dan Henderson looking for his target. He's placed his, he placed his left hand and he's going to come up underneath with a big, powerful uppercut. So it's not just the overhand right that generates a lot of power. It's whenever he throws this right hand, in whatever circumstance, whether it's coming up or... <laughs> exactly. We'll cover that in a second as well. But look at that. He plants his back foot and he fires that straight through, catches Tim Bosch on the chin, circles him onto the fence, lands a quick knee, but then watch this. He places his hand, he looks for his target, and then he comes right up the centre. It's a beautiful oh, punch. Yeah, because you think he's doing the right... He thinks he's doing the right thing. But the opening's always there, yeah. especially with these four-ounce gloves. There's always an opening. And here against Vitor Belfort, working that inside low kick, you know, just keeping people on the back foot, keeping people on the outside. This was his last fight against Hector Lombard, which really was probably his best performance in the UFC. You can see him using the inside low kick here, which actually set up the head kick. I think he actually said he was going to knock him out with a head kick, and a lot of people thought he was joking. But you see here with that right hand that he lands there, look, lands the kick and then rocks himself over to generate power for the, for the right hand. Here's the head kick. Look, he faints with the, faints with the right, head kick comes up, and what a beautiful knockout with an elbow. And what's nice about this is it shows Dan Henderson at 46 years old still being creative. Yeah. He said in his post-fight interview, this is not something that I train in the gym. It's not something you can train in the gym. This is just hours and hours of repetition mm. of, oh, he's got my leg, there's an opportunity for that. Or yeah. with the Vanderlei thing, I'm going to expose my back a little bit so I can throw the spinning back fist. I mean, I think even Dan Henderson was a little bit surprised at that <laughs> because Hector Lombard is just such a monster. Um, and to get such a dramatic win over a guy that is, is you know, notorious for knocking people out, it, it, you know, it really showed that Dan Henderson's still a very dangerous individual, and, yeah. and it set him up for this, this opportunity against Michael. Yeah, OK. We're going to go back to our social media. Love it. And I'm going to come all the way across to this one here. Bits being circled into the H-bomb before. How will Hendo make him do it again, and how will Bisping avoid being circled into it? Well, I think I was kind of getting at that earlier in the show, but thank you, Peter. Mm. Give you another opportunity to talk about that. Yeah, well, there are a few things he can do, and, and there are a lot of developments in Michael's game which we've seen in recent fights which are going to be very useful in, in, this, uh, in this rematch. Now, the next playlist I've put together is effectively the game plan that I would like to see him follow. If I was in his corner, I would be saying these things to him. The first clip I've, I've pulled is against Kung Lee. And as you can see, now he's fighting the southpaw. Again, he's circling towards the backhand, which I don't want to see, but I do want to see him circling that direction against Dan Henderson. Against, uh, against Belcher, he used really good footwork, constantly changing his direction, keeping him on the end of the punch and not, not getting too drawn into a slugfest. He steps in, he lands, he steps out, he moves away. You can see him leaning back then, but he was, he's able to move his back foot so he's further out of range of the right hand. I just love how he was moving his feet. And then against Tim Kennedy here, he did great work against the fence, stepping in, lands a couple of shots, then steps out. But then when he sees Dan Henderson's hurt, he's got to start working, he's got to start crowding him. Because there's a, there's a danger in that right hand. He's being too close and being too far away. And if he's, if he's, if he's close enough, he can smother that right hand. Mm -hmm. And he's got great work, he's got good clinch work and good knees. And the other thing we have to say about Michael Bisping, because his conditioning is so good, yes. it's a massive weapon for him. Mm against a guy that's, that's later on in his career, like Dan Henderson, that does fight at a nice, steady pace, hunting for that big right hand. If Michael, even if Michael's not landing most of his shots, if he's flustering Dan Henderson, it makes that forward progression uh, hesitant. The Anderson Silva fight. This was the first time I'd really seen him use this punch to great effect, and it's a, it's a long, looping, kind of, kind of left hook, kind of a jab. It's a very strange punch. I don't see many other people using it. Um, my boxing coach would call it a Euro hook because we turn the knuckles down. And it's, a, it, it's a lot of European boxers use this in, uh, in Olympic level boxing right. because it's a very effective punch. And Michael used it really well against Southpaws. He used it against Rockhold, which we'll see in a second. But what you'll see is he loops over the top of the lead shoulder. Now, obviously, Dan Henderson's an orthodox fighter, so generally that's not going to be applicable in the same way as it is here. But what it will do is it, it will occupy that that right hand. It will keep Dan Henderson from starting to wing this over the top. If he knows this side of his face is constantly being touched, even if it's just a check hook, just to remind him to keep that hand up, it, it nullifies this weapon, it, it occupies this hand so he's not 
he's not as keen as he was in the first fight to keep winging it over the top and throwing it one after another. So let's just watch this, how he used it against Anderson Silva here. He comes in with a jab, he looks over the top. Now look at that as a long, straight yeah. arm, knuckles turned down. Beautiful punch. It's something that is a development to, to boxing for mixed martial arts. Yeah, I was going to say, would that work in boxing with the bigger gloves and the fact that the shoulder's there? I, I, think, I think that's why my coach calls it the Euro hook, because he sees it a lot in Olympic boxing. Obviously, Olympic boxing is much more of a point scoring thing than, than a you know, landing knockout. crushing blows. Okay. So, yes, it's a great point scoring thing, but with mixed martial arts, you can't invest power in every punch that you throw. Yeah. You have to land short, fast punches, you have to land long, fast punches, but then also the long, and long fast punches also set up the, the nice big power punches as sure. well. And as we know with Michael Bisping, with such a high striking rate, almost 1,500 strikes, significant strikes in his fights, he has such a high work rate, and you can't throw every single one of those punches with no. power. So you've got to use, like Joanna does, flusters you against the fence to disguise that one power punch. We spoke about it with Chuck Liddell Tito as well, did the yep. same thing. You can't invest 100% power in every strike, and that's something that Michael does very well. So what he does is he catches Anderson Silva off guard. He's able to step in with the right hand that sets up a shorter left hook there that puts Anderson Silva on the floor. It's beautiful work. And I mean, obviously Anderson Silva was surprised by that as well. You can see his face as he goes down. He's got a grin on his face. And here we go again. Look how long it is. Catches him, knocks him off balance, allows Michael to step in with a short left hook. It looks like it would be easier for him to land that against Hendo as well, who's leaning forward a lot more and he's shorter. So it's not go. as much effort to come over the top. Exactly, exactly. And the other thing as well is because it's a long punch, what you'll notice is that his shoulder will come up, which will cover this side of his face. Right. So whenever you're throwing punches, if, if I'm throwing a right hand, for example, here, I'm covering this side of my face with the, with the hand that's not, but my shoulder is covering the other side. And, and what this allows him to do is to bring his shoulder up to cover that right hand, so he just needs to keep his chin tucked into his shoulder. This is obviously the, 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 the fight that we all remember the best of Michael's, which was a real surprise for a lot of Short people. Short notice as well. Yep. He looked great, one of his best fights. So he actually uses it here, look, misses, because, because uh, Rockhold uh, catches him with the jab on the way in. But in the follow-up, you'll see Michael circles back, Rockhold leans in with a, with a lazy punch, and Michael comes straight over the top, boom, there it is again. Let's just watch that one more time. It's, it, again, it, it's, a, it's such an un unusual punch. Sort of wraps him around the jaw. Yeah, it? I mean, you know, the, the, a long left hook is not necessarily something you would have used against a southpaw fighter. The other thing it does is it places his foot a lot of the time on, on the inside, which is, not, which is not a comfortable place a lot of the time for, for a lead foot if you're trying that's to take control. That's what Rockhold does, funny enough, that's, what Rockhold, which, that's where he is there, look. Yeah. Foot's on the inside, uses that jab, which has not, not made contact. Now watch this. He's going to step forward with a short right hook, but then he's going to come over the top. Look at that, beautiful, right on the chin. Yeah. And he's able to push forward. Rockhold's already hurt. Michael sees his opportunity. And the other thing I love as well in this one, as we play it on, watch, watch Jason Perillo in the corner. He knows the fight's over. Hands up, <laughs> arms folded. It was, it was a beautiful knockout. We're probably crediting him for some of this work as well, because he's the guy who's been working on yes, Michael's hands. very much so. But, I mean, Michael's a seasoned kickboxer. He's been doing this a long time. Then there's the short left that knocked him down, knocked Anderson Silva down as well. It seems to be quite a, quite a comfortable routine for him to come over the top with the long one, then step in with a shorter left hook. Yeah. Here it is again, right over the top, catches Rockhold right on the side of the face. Beautiful punch. I'm not necessarily saying that he's going to catch Hendo with this and knock him out. I mean, Hendo's got a head like a brick, so it's not, he's not easy to, you know, to catch with a good clean shot anyway. But it will keep that side of his face occupied. It will keep that hand occupied, which means that he's going to be less likely to continually throw the right hand, which will then make it easier for Michael to see coming. Yeah. What a fight. What a fight. What it's... a beautiful rematch and what a beautiful story as well to go yes. into it. You know, a great first title defence for Michael to be able to come back to Manchester and kind of pay something back to his fans and also bring over a legend like Dan Henderson and maybe even the score with that knockout. Who knows? What a story for Michael Bisping. We were breaking down, I think, a dollar wave fight with him and is this the last chance he's going to get to make a run at the title. Next fight, Rockhold, I think it was in Sydney. If he loses here, surely he's not going to get a title yeah. shot. Now, he's back in the UK defending his belt against the guy that's been haunting him for so many years. Love it. Oh, the storyline's <laughs> awesome. 
So don't forget, this is the first of three shows coming your way in the build-up to UFC 204. Next time out, we look at two fights with huge implications for their respective divisions. Vitor Belfort wants another run at the UFC middleweight title, but so too does Gegard Mousasi. These two veterans have a lot to lose, but with the middleweight gold in sight, so much more to gain. And in the light heavyweight division, Ovin St. Preux looks to bounce back from his loss to John Jones against an equally hungry Jimmy Manua, with both men looking to remain relevant at the very top of the division. Make sure to check out that next show for full analysis on both of those fights. And remember to get involved in the comments below to be part of the conversation. Well, will UFC 204 be remembered as the glorious homecoming for Michael Bisbee or when Dan Henderson left the game at the very top? Bisbee caught him on the left, and again, Michael Bisbee is the new UFC middleweight champion.